some of the research is looking at the following mechanisms that thyroid hormone, um, that are pertinent to thyroid hormone, I should say. For one, local ligand availability. What this refers to is you might do blood tests and find normal TSH and normal T3 and normal T4 in the serum or in the blood, we might say, but what's really going on in the local tissues might be another story altogether. What actually reaches uh, cell receptors or nuclear receptors or what's able to bind or what's able to act as an agonist downstream might be different than what's available in the blood. So doing different ligand studies in tissues. We're also then that can lead to looking at cell-specific thyroid hormone transporters. So not only are we looking at what is uh, what sort of cofactors and enzyme systems and signal transduction pathways occur in the thyroid gland itself, but what's happening in an ova, for example? What's happening in cardiac muscle? What's happen happening in the adipose stores or in the adipocyte? There all might be different cell-specific transporters that help receive or transduce that signal. Furthermore, the phenomenon of co-repression and co-activation sort of hints at what a can of worms complexity the hormone and the endocrine system crosstalk or signaling is. Many hormones, reproductive hormones, thyroid hormones, work at the level of the uh, nuclear membrane or nuclear receptors. And what the concept of co-repressor or co-activator means is that there's different sorts of receptors, both on cell membranes and in this case nuclear membranes. Think of them as maybe little dots on the um, surrounding a sphere, and some of those little dots receive a thyroid hormone, some receive estrogen, some receive progesterone, some receive retinoic acid, for example. In the presence of different hormones and different nutrients and different compounds, binding all those little dots might increase the signal from thyroid hormone or might decrease the signal from thyroid hormone, sort of double it, mute it, neutralize it. And this is the phenomena being referred to as co-repressors and co-activators. Furthermore, thyroid hormones and receptors might have different isoforms, meaning that overall thyroid hormone might be able to bind to the different sorts of thyroid receptors, but just as we've been looking at estrogen and finding that there's alpha estrogen receptors and beta estrogen receptors, etc., there's different forms, there's slightly different molecular shapes to that sort of coil of protein that is a hormone receptor which is referred to as its isoform. And then what I've been referring to as crosstalk. I didn't make the term up that's being used in the medical literature of late to refer to how our different endocrine organs, how the different hormones themselves, how co-repression, agonism, antagonism send signals back and forth in uh, immensely complex ways. And just to keep up with the literature in one field would really be a full-time job looking at all of these mechanisms, ligand ability and transporters and co-activators and co-repressors and isoforms and enzyme systems and gene expression, which I will save for another day. But these are all mechanisms looking at how complex the thyroid hormone is outside of just looking at T3 and T4. And Dr. Michael Friedman and Dr. Dennis Wilson are particularly um, world experts in this particular field of keeping up with this vast sort of array of cutting edge research going on in these fields. The importance of local regulation of thyroid hormones in target tissues then is obvious. So not only are we looking at just the pituitary competence or output of TSH and the thyroid's ability to produce uh, thyroid hormones or, or to prevent the production of excess thyroid hormones in the case of hyperthyroidism, 
what happens downstream, as I've said, within different tissues, within different cells, at the level of the nuclear membrane, and at the level of transducing that signal, <clears throat> and in the thyroid itself, involves different enzyme systems, as the previous slide looked at. Some of those enzyme systems are highly researched, and some of them come up in the herbal research, so I'd like to mention a few before we go on. For one, um, iodination is highly involved with both making thyroid hormone and then recycling, kind of breaking it down, deconstructing it, and putting it back together again. As everyone is probably aware, thyroid hormones are made from tyrosine, the amino acid, and iodine. In fact, three atoms of iodine per molecule of tyrosine. So the iodinase enzymes add iodine by iodine. So first we make monoiodotyrosine, MIT, and then we add another iodine and make diiodotyrosine, DIT, and then we add the third atom of iodine and make tiiodotyrosine, which is active thyroid hormone, or T3. And that can be converted to T4, sometimes reverse T3. And these all involve our iodinase and deiodinase enzymes. So some of those local cell effects look at the expression. How do cells produce these deiodinase and iodinase enzymes, and thereby what is their metabolic efficiency, as well as metabolic um, efficiency in breaking down or degrading thyroid hormone and recycling it. Another enzyme that is involved in thyroid hormones is phosphodiesterase. And this particularly um, is also known because of its role in cyclic AMP. And I have another slide coming up later this evening that will talk a little bit about cyclic AMP and what that has to do with receiving hormones or signal transduction. So the diiodinase and the phosphodiesterase enzymes are both um, researched in great detail, and there's quite a lot of medical literature evolving these in disease states, evolving these in nutritional balance, and involving the competence of these enzyme systems in hypo and hyperthyroidism, as well as some of those extra thyroid diseases we mentioned, such as infertility and metabolic syndrome and so on, that thyroid hormone might play a role in. There's a few other enzymes that could be a fate of thyroid hormone that I'm not really going to go into because the herbal research has not really matured to the point to involve them, but there's sulfation pathways and there's peroxidation pathways that are particularly involved with producing thyroid-stimulating immune globulins in cases of autoimmune thyroiditis, and that will come up again in a moment. Researchers are looking at the association between iodinase activities and extrathyroid disorders mentioned in the first few slides. So for one, there's a type 1 deiodinase enzyme referred to as D1 iodothyronine deiodinase, or D1 enzyme is involved with the T4 to T3 ratio and how what kind of balance a person might keep in their bloodstream and in their tissues. But this enzyme system is also known to play a role in our glucose levels and maintaining uh, a certain fasting glucose and also insulin-like growth factors. So here this is painting a picture of an enzyme system that looks like it could be involved as well with diabetes or insulin resistance or in general glucose regulation. Contrasting that with the type 2, iodothyronine deiodinase or D2 enzyme, seems to be more involved with various inflammatory disorders outside of its role in producing thyroid hormones or outside of its thyroid function. Osteoarthritis is known uh, to be affected by deiodinase or D2 levels. IQ alterations that are associated with iodine deficiency, such as cretinism, the congenital uh, defect associated with low iodine status, is known to be affected by D2. Hypertension 
and mental disorders in general, like, uh, such as onset in adulthood or forgetfulness and fuzzy thinking or cognitive decline. So D2 paints more of a picture of perhaps inflammatory diseases or states or tissue uh, disruption or tissue defects. This is the reference for what I just mentioned with the different deiodinase enzymes and their particular roles, and the researchers quote, intriguingly, most such associations with systemic diseases are independent of thyroid hormone levels, suggesting that local regulation of thyroid hormones in tissues is extremely important. And that's what we mentioned at the beginning, that not only are we looking at T3 and T4 and TSH and TSI for our patients as diagnostic criteria for hypo and hyperthyroidism, those of us kind of working with the more subtle presentations of hypothyroidism, such as subclinical so-called hypothyroidism, or all the, the diseases that might involve a touch of low thyroid function, such as infertility, metabolic syndrome, amenorrhea, uh, weight gain and obesity, et cetera. These researchers report that you won't necessarily be able to prove hypothyroidism with those blood tests, the standard T3, T4, TSH laboratory analysis alone. Making assays for deiodinase enzymes and leptins and signal transduction and insulin resistance, et cetera, helping us put the whole big picture together and give us more diagnostic tools. So in summary, the conditions where thyroid hormones may be therapeutic include, and this is the short list, obesity, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and depression. It might be worth it for any and all patients struggling with such conditions, or especially when people don't respond to our typical treatments we expect to work for these conditions, but we might consider a trial run of thyroid support even in the face of normal thyroid blood tests. Environmental toxins might also contribute to thyroid disease. So for any patient with both hyper or hyperfunction, we'll take a look at therapies for those and <laughs> immediately following here. But these have all been found to either disrupt signals, disrupt the production of thyroid hormone, contribute to inflammatory damage in one way or another, and thereby uh, worth it in our history taking and perhaps our lab evaluations to investigate. Halides, of course, are in the same family as iodine itself, which we'll look at more closely, bromine, chlorine, fluorine, etc., might interfere with iodine uptake. In a general healthy diet, we consume these in such balance amounts, balanced amounts that it's not particularly uh, problematic. However, because these are used in industrial cleaning, because we use these in uh, pesticides, because we find them as conditioners for dough and breads and all sorts of surprising uh, ways that greatly increase our intake of these halides more so than a whole food diet would, how uh, this might be contributing to someone's thyroid disorder. Heavy metals, we know how problematic heavy metals are to the kidneys and to the liver and to the neurons and tissues and known to trigger other autoimmune diseases. There's some investigations that in metals such as cadmium, lead, mercury may interfere with the conversion of T3 to T4, ultimately are all are associated with lower T3 levels. Uh, chemicals, just in general, uh, man-made chemicals, the organochlorides, one being a halide, PCBs, uh, various sorts of plastics are also known to antagonize thyroid hormone receptors as well as cause other sorts of endocrine disruption. It's being looked at widely in the, in the environmental toxicity literature. And then low antioxidant levels. One of the ways, of course, our body has to protect us from lead and mercury and chemicals or all sorts of inflammatory processes in the body 
are with our standard antioxidant vitamins, the retinoids such as beta carotene, and in particular research on vitamin E, C, and selenium in the case of thyroid inflammation, and mechanisms whereby heavy metals and the above named chemicals do damage to the thyroid. Also, antioxidant levels, uh, when they're low, can worsen or just heighten the symptoms of both hyper and hypothyroidism. For one, elevated TSH, whether it's abnormal because of a, a state of hyperthyroidism and excessive production of TSH, or whether the cells aren't responding, that kind of TSH resistance in a state of hypothyroidism, but elevated TSH itself is known to cause inflammatory um, just inflammatory processes in the body. So it's a double whammy, you might say, if you're also selenium, vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc deficient, that inflammation can be uh, particularly harmful. And as we saw with some of the previous slides, osteoarthritis and tissue damage and heart inflammation, uh, cardiovascular inflammation might also be a symptom or go hand in hand with the arthritic, or excuse me, with the hypothyroid inflammatory processes and hyperthyroid inflammatory processes. So low antioxidant levels certainly are known to contribute to both poles of thyroid dysfunction.